Lord Corlys of House Valarian, and their son and heir, Selena Valarian. The future king consort. Lord Corlys Valerion Origins, richest man in Westeros and greatest seafarer in the history of the known world, explored. The world of Game of Thrones is one rich with culture, history, traditions, and most importantly, men whose feats can only be called legend. Bran the Builder created the Wall, the High Tower and Storm's End if you want to believe all the old legends. Garth Greenhand was the progenitor of every house in the Reach. The Grey King ruled the Iron Islands for a thousand years and sat in a throne made from the bones of the Sea Dragon Naga. But while all these figures are mythical heroes who existed at the Dawn Age, there is one man whose accomplishments put him on a peg equal to them. In George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire, the seas and oceans of the known world are treacherous mistresses, prone to taking a ship as easily as wine takes a man's wits. But there is one person who managed to chart them all. His name is Lord Corlys Valerion, but men know him as the Sea Snake, the richest man in the world, or quite simply, a living naval god amongst men. You've already seen him in action in House of the Dragon, but what exactly do you know about Lord Corlys besides his clear ambition? If you answered nothing, then this is the video you've been looking for, because this is Lord Corlys Valerion's origins explored. And spoiler warning because there will be a lot of those in here. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. He is the second Corlys tied to the Targaryen legacy, the story of the first Corlys Valerion. If you guys have watched our videos on Laenor Valerion and Sea Smoke, which you should if you haven't already, then you would know that House Valerion has been tied to the Targaryen family by blood even before they conquered the Seven Kingdoms. During their time as Lords of Dragonstone, the Targaryens developed close ties with the Valerions of Driftmark said to relocate to the Narrow Sea even before the last Dragon Lords of the world, and eventually began the tradition of intermarriage, which was an ancient Valyrian custom. The Lady Valena Valerion was the mother of the Conqueror's Three, Aegon, Visenya, and Rhaenys, and it was her family that became the second house of the realm once Aegon had declared his intention to claim the Seven Kingdoms by conquest. Valena's blood relative Daemon Valerion was one of Aegon's oldest and closest friends. He was present for the declaration of Aegon's conquest and his ships carried the trio of dragon riders and all their men to the mouth of the Blackwater Rush where the Aegon Fort was constructed. For his undying loyalty and his great friendship, Aegon made Daemon his first master of ships and Lord Admiral of the Royal Fleet, tasking him with the conquest of Gulltown in the Vale by sea and sending Visenya along with him. And while Lord Daemon was able to stalemate the Vale's fleet to an extent, he lost his own life in the battle in the waters of Gulltown and was avenged by Visenya, who burned the Aran fleet with Vagar's dragon flame. After his death, his eldest son Aethon succeeded him as Lord of the Tides, Master of Driftmark, Master of Ships, and Lord Admiral of the Royal Fleet, whilst his second son had to wait for nearly a decade to find service worthy of his name in the King's Court. Though the histories do not make mention of this, we can assume that Sir Corlys Valerion had served in Aegon's wars and distinguished himself exceptionally because by the time his king had been seated upon his iron throne for ten years, he was a knight himself. Then in 10 AC, an incident occurred which demanded his loyalty to his kin and king be tested day in and day out from that point onward. The year 10 AC was the same year when Queen Rhaenys died at Hellholt, and in their grief, Aegon and Visenya burned the Dornish sands to glass. They also put bounties on the heads of several Dornish lords, and more often than not, the men who went to claim these bounties would not return to claim their rewards, even after carrying out their jobs. In response, the Dornish put bounties on Aegon and Visenya's heads, and the streets of King's Landing became a war zone. 
Thrice King Aegon was attacked by Catspaws, working for the Lords of the Red Sands, but thrice he was saved by his personal guard's intervention, though the last encounter was a close one, and if Visenya hadn't used Dark Sister, the Conqueror might not have lived beyond that point, and even after getting attacked this close to his seat and home, when Aegon refused to beef up his personal security, Visenya cut her brother's cheek with Dark Sister before any of his guards could even draw their swords and made her point abundantly clear. The Dragon Queen decided to establish an elite royal guard that would protect their High King from all troubles at all times. She modeled their vows after the Night's Watch vows and decided that the Force would have seven different knights representing the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros. She also personally selected the members of this order, and in the year 10 AC, the very first iteration of the Kingsguard was unveiled to the known world, with all seven members handpicked by Queen Visenya. And the first Lord Commander of this 300 year strong brotherhood was none other than the son of Aegon's first Lord of Ships and the brother of his second Lord Admiral, Sir Corlys Valerion. Sir Corlys served his king and kin faithfully for several years, and was renowned for his strength and agility as well as his feats of bravery in the field. By all accounts, it is known that he was singularly devoted to the protection of his king, because the first duty of a king's guard was to protect their king, and being the first Lord Commander, it was his duty to set an example. Sadly, we know nothing more about his life and times because we don't have access to the White Book and we aren't Jaime Lannister because that is as far as the histories go when it comes to recording Sir Corlys' deeds. It is said that he served in his post nobly and honorably until his death, after which he was succeeded in his post by one of his sworn brothers, Sir Addison Hill who replaced him during King Aegon's reign. This means that out of the 27 years that lie between the establishment of the Kingsguard and the death of King Aegon Targaryen in 37 AC, Sir Corlys must have served at least for half a decade to have built up such a reputation in the histories of Archmaester Gildane. But it also means that he must have known his nephew Daemon, his brother Aethon's son through his lady wife Alara Macy. And this is an important detail. Though we do not know the exact date of Daemon's birth, we do know that he was born either sometime before the conquest during the tail end of the Century of Blood, or he was born right before Aegon's second coronation at Old Town, because by the time Corlys was called to serve for the Kingsguard, Daemon must have come to know his uncle properly, and he must have also held a great love for him in his heart, because he himself would go on to be replaced by the Corlys that is the topic of this video itself. And Lord Daemon is also important to this discussion, because he was one of the proudest Valerian lords in known history. Daemon was Lord of the Tides, Master of Driftmark, and Master of Ships to two kings, Magor and Jaehaerys, and he rose to become the latter's hand as well. During his time spent serving on the Royal Council, he would often protect House Valerion's status as the second house of the realm on account of their close political and blood ties with the Targaryens. Lord Daemon was the embodiment of Valerion pride, a true seafarer, and a hard yet reasonable man, and these traits he passed on to his successor as master of Driftmark, his grandson Corlys. He was born to sail the seas, the early life of Corlys Valerion. Corlys Valerion was born in the third year of the majority reign of King Jaehaerys Targaryen on the island of Driftmark. The histories are unkind to him when it comes to recording who his birth parents were. But given the fact that he inherited Driftmark after Lord Daemon, we feel uncomfortable saying he was the eldest son of Daemon's purported eldest son Corwin. He was named after Great Grand Uncle, who, as we've already recounted, was the first Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, indicating that his parents and grandfather saw great promise in the child. We never do get an official description of how he looked, but given his Valyrian heritage, we can assume that Corlys had also manifested traits usually assigned to that doom civilization. Silvery hair, purple eyes, and a certain restlessness in his personality that made him destined for greatness and madness in equal measure. Though he would go on to earn his nickname, the Sea Snake, several decades later, he began proving he was worthy of it from a very young age. Archmaester Gilday notes in his histories that he dreamt of the sea during his boyhood, and his life truly reflects that statement. Corlys got his first taste of life on deck at the age of six, when he visited Pentos, 
with an uncle of his. Given the fact that Jorgen Valerion is said to have passed away in 59 AC because of the shivers, it could be that the uncle who accompanied him on that voyage across the narrow sea was Victor Valerion. But while the matter of which uncle accompanied which brother's nephew to Pentos in 59 AC is something we can sit here and dispute until the end of our days, the one thing that cannot be disputed is the fact that Corlys was born to sail and raised on the sea. Following his trip to Pentos, he spent every subsequent year taking an annual voyage, learning all the crafts of seafaring from experience and by hand. Every captain he ever sailed under said that they had never seen a more natural sailor than Corlys, and by the age of 16, he became a captain himself. At his majority, Corlys said the fishing boat called Cod Queen from Driftmark to Dragonstone and back, marking his first official voyage as a sea captain. To put things in perspective, the only other major character we know of who became a captain that young, Asha Greyjoy, took command of the Black Wind sometime around the age of 20, and her younger brother Theon had never even sailed on a proper voyage by the time he turned 16, let alone captaining his own longship. So Corlys is one of the youngest sea captains in known history, and especially amongst Westerosi nobles, and he would quickly prove that he was determined to also become the greatest. In his elder years, the Sea Snake would like to say that he is clinging to life like a drowning sailor clinging to the wreckage of a sunken ship. But in his youth, he would prove that by traveling far and wide by the time he reached the age of 23. The First Voyages of the Sea Snake In the seven years between the time he first captained a ship and the time his skill set went from being recognized to being considered as a formidable challenge, Corlys had already sailed around the lands that his house had called home for nearly two centuries. He made a long voyage to the western coast of Westeros, presumably from Driftmark, because he is said to have visited the cities of Pentos, Tyrosh, Myr, Lees, Old Town, Lannisport, and Lordsport in one go. If you take a look at the map of the known world, you'll see that these cities lie in something of a crescent formation if you take Driftmark as the starting point of the voyage. So Corley sailed under the belly of Westeros and reached the farthest city west of Iron Men's Bay. It is not known whether he stopped at the Greenblood at Bear Isle during his particular voyage, but it is possible as they would have been logical destinations for what seemed like a trip made to familiarize Corleys with the secrets of the Narrow and Sunset Sea. He took the Summer Maid to Old Volantes and the Summer Isles down south of Westeros. When he captained the Ice Wind, Corlys traveled to Bravos and Lorath, completing his journeys to all the daughters of Old Valyria who had ports in their free cities. He also took the ship to the port of Ibn, one of the farthest trading posts in the northern hemisphere of the known world, and to Eastwatch by the sea, and Hardhome as well, crossing the wall to reach the screaming caves of a long abandoned wildling settlement that could have become the only true town beyond the wall had a mysterious burning not turned it into an ashy ruin some five odd centuries ago. Corlys attempted to go beyond a cursed hard home to find a northern route around Westeros, like he had once crossed over to the Sunset Sea by going around Dorne. If he managed to find a trade route that opened from the Shivering Sea into the Bay of Ice, it would mean an untold fortune for him and his family. But alas, all he found in the White Waste were frozen seas and massive icebergs blocking any movement further north. So he turned his ice wolf around and returned his grandsire's seat in Driftmark. Life at sea is not for the faint-hearted or the weak, and fights break out all the time when sailors catch even a whiff of a discomfort coming their way. Corlys had proven his valor at arms during the time he conducted these early feats of seafaring excellence, and was knighted for them, thus becoming Sir Corlys Valerion. So, at 23 years old, Corlys, the grandson of the man who upheld the Valerion status as the second house of the realm, had earned himself enough naval accolades to merit the nickname Sea Snake. Impressed by his accomplishments, Queen Alysanne Targaryen sent her eighth-born child Dela to Driftmark to get to know this daring young man and hopefully like him enough to winkle out a proper betrothal. But on her way there, the princess becomes seasick and upon her return from Driftmark, she remarks that Lord Corlys likes his ships better than he liked her. Though it is true that Lord Corlys' first love was the sea, he wasn't exactly averse to the charms of women. Princess Dela, though a good-natured woman by all accounts, was also dull and simple-minded. 
she was not exactly the kind of woman the ambitious and restless Corlys Valerion would want to marry, and we know this because up until this point, there is no mention of there ever being a match arranged for him by his family. But that didn't really matter to the Sea Snake, because after building the ship of his dreams, called Sea Snake, where he derives his nickname from, Lord Corlys Valerion decided to become the equivalent of what Christopher Columbus means to our world. The Sea Snake's fabled nine voyages, an ascension to the titles of Lord of the Tides and Master of Driftmark. Lord Corley's Valerion Sea Snake was built for deep waters and long voyages. Both of these things were crucial for an undertaking as gigantic as his nine voyages. During his travels, Corley's accomplished many firsts for a Westerosi, and suffered many firsts as a but a mortal man. On his first voyage, he became the first Westerosi to successfully cross the Jade Gates, and reach Yaitai and Leng by sea, because usually, the toll for passing through that particular strait is set exorbitantly high by their Carthan overlords. The Sea Snake filled his coffers with as much treasure as he could find, loading skilks, spices, and precious gems like jade in his hold, and doubling his family's overall wealth upon his return. Every subsequent voyage only increased their wealth, for his second voyage, the Sea Snake traveled to the Shadowlands, reaching Ashai by the Shadow, most likely through the Cinnamon Straits. It is said that during this voyage, Corlys lost his first love and half his men. The first love can be a reference to his love for the sea, but given the fact that he undertook seven more voyages after this, it is unlikely that the histories refer to his passion for being a mariner. It's more likely that this referred to a woman and might also explain why Corlys didn't exactly pay suit to Princess Dela upon her arrival to Driftmark. As for exactly how she and half of Corlys' men died, well, there is a simpler answer for that. The Curse of the City of Ashai. It is said that most people who call on Ashai never linger for too long for the city itself seems to inflict them with a disease that none can recover from. Children do not dwell in Ashai, and animals do not live for there for too long. All of the city's supplies are brought in by ship, including fresh water and the fishes of the native river Ash are so foul that only shadowbinders and fools dare eat of their flesh. It's possible that the mysterious curse of Ashai was responsible for the death of Corlys' lover and half of his crew, and it could be that the Enverans got to Corlys himself, despite his Valyrian blood because in later years, he would swear that he saw a ship docked in the port of Ashai that could only have been Elisa Farman's son Chaser. The story of Eliza Farman is one that deserves its own video, but to make a long story short, three years after Corlys' birth, another naval captain of much renown, though her fame was more infamy, if we're being honest, set sail to discover what's west of Westeros. Setting sail from Old Town with her Sun Chaser and two ships captained by Lord Hightower's sons, Eliza Farman went into the Sunset Sea aiming to find undiscovered lands and peoples to boot, but only one ship ever returned from her voyage, and the surviving sailors spoke more of the dangers of the adventure than the discover of the three islands that Eliza managed to accomplish. These islands, whom she named Aegon, Visenya, and Rhaenys, were the farthest known lands that any person in the known world could have possibly visited, farther even than lonely light off of Ironman's Bay. The known world is exactly like our world, if not slightly larger in its literal scope, so it only makes sense that if she kept going west, she would eventually emerge in the east. Ashai was as far east as anyone dared venture, so Corlys wouldn't be entirely wrong in assuming that the massive deep water and long voyage friendly ship he saw in the docks of the city by the shadow was Sun Chaser. It would also match up with the timing somewhat as Corley's voyages took place sometime between 77 and 89 AC, but till this day, none can confirm the truth of the matter, and it will remain a mystery for the rest of our days. What is not a mystery is that Corley's then went on to become the first Westerosi to explore the map of the Thousand Isles and visit the secret city called Nefer near Nagai and Masovi, the northern and easternmost port in the known world. With this, Corlys had enough naval explorations under his belt to give Lomas Longstrider a run for his money, and he was just in his third great voyage. Sadly, none of the voyages after this are recorded, and we only have our imagination to rely upon hereafter. It's reasonable to expect that Corlys explored locations like the Basilisk Isles and the continent of Sothorios to an extent, for even though they have a black reputation, there is treasure to be had there for one brave enough to take hold of it.
He might also have sailed south of Ashai to the unknown wilderness of Ulthos, which remains unmapped till this day. Corlys might have taken his ships to the three islands Eliza found, or he could have sailed from the Isle of Leng to the Saffron Straits, and ventured past the farther known island in the East Ulos, to find treasures and horrors beyond any manner of speaking. Or he could have just kept revisiting the first three places to keep making fat stacks, because all we know about his ninth and final voyage is that he stopped at Karth with a hold full of gold and brought twenty ships, filling all of them with spices, silks, and all manner of riches. He even bought elephants, probably aspiring to be the first Westerosi lord to have war elephants in his army, but they all died in transport. Lord Corlys lost six of the twenty ships he set out with from Karth upon his return to Driftmark from his ninth great voyage, but the combined resources of the other fourteen made him the wealthiest man in all Westeros and House Valerion, the wealthiest house in the Seven Kingdoms, even more affluent than the Lannisters of Casterly Rock and the High Towers of Old Town. During these nine voyages, Corlys suffered tragedy in his family as well, as his father and mother passed away, and so did his uncle Victor. Upon his grandsire Daemon's death, Sir Corlys Valerion became the Lord of the Tides and the Master of Driftmark, and he made it his life's mission to continue his grandfather's life's mission, preserve House Valerion's status as the second house of the realm. Master of Ships and the Greatest Lord in all the Seven Kingdoms, Lord Corlys Valerion marries into House Targaryen. Upon ascending the Driftwood Throne, Lord Corlys decided to put his accumulated wealth to use and sanctioned the creation of a new seat of power. He was a man who had made his own name and earned his wealth off the strength of his own back, and so it was only fitting that his seat reflected the self-made nature of his current level of influence. High Tide was created with Palestone, just like the Eyrie which was the seat of House Arryn, the Wardens of the East. High Tide was located off the Isle of Driftmark, and when the tides came in high, the only thing that connected the castle to the island was a causeway, much like the bridges of Castle Pike, the ancestral seat of House Greyjoy of the Iron Islands. The slender towers of the castle were roofed with beaten silver, so when the sun hit it at just the right angle, the entire castle shone and its faults and cellars were deep enough to house all of the treasures that Lord Corlys has accumulated over the decades. Deep and clean because Castle Driftmark was known to damp and flooded on most occasions. He shifted the Driftwood throne to High Tide, and then regained his grandsire's old post on the small council. In 89 AC, Corlys was named the Master of Ships and the Lord Admiral of the Royal Fleet which technically made his sea snake the flagship as the royal fleet was traditionally the composed of Valerian ships. Corlys arrived at court to assume his post, and within the year was married to the most powerful woman in the Seven Kingdoms, Princess Rhaenys Targaryen. The story goes that the princess had taken to Lord Corlys when he arrived at court, and when she came of age, announced her intention to marry him. King Jaehaerys greatly approved of the match, and the two were wedded in 90 AC in a wedding ceremony for the ages. It is said that when Lord Corlys told Princess Rhaenys he would sail to the end of the world for her, she told him they would go there together, but she would get there first as she would be flying. At the wedding ceremony, Corlys' bride-to-be arrived on the back of her dragon Maelys after insisting upon doing so, which must have just been wonderful for him as well. With this match, Corlys Valerion became not only one of the richest men in the Seven Kingdoms, but also one of the most politically important ones as well, because Princess Rhaenys had long been the subject of a succession dispute. Given the fact that she was the eldest daughter and only child of Prince Aemon, heir to the Iron Throne at the time, if she were to ascend to the Iron Throne, Corlys would become the first king consort in the history of the realm. It might even be possible that the next king of Westeros would bear the name Valerion, and maybe, just maybe, the three-headed dragon would be replaced by the seahorse and fire and blood would finally bend to the old, the true, the brave. Don't quote us on that last bit though. And so Corlys began his tenure as perhaps the most politically secure man at the beginning of the 90th year of Targaryen reign in the Seven Kingdoms. But he would soon find out that some customs do not die out easy, and he would also cut himself VIP tickets to the Dance of the Dragons through his actions in the years that followed after his marriage. Selena and Rhaenyra's children shall take their father's name, Valarian. 
Lord Corley's his ambition, Princess Rainey's rights, and House Valerion's status in the lead up to the Dance of the Dragons. Corlys served King Jaehaerys Targaryen faithfully and ably for two years before the matter of succession ended up creating a rift between the first two houses of the realm that would never truly heal in his own lifetime. In 92 AC, word reached the small council that the eastern half of the island of Tarth had been completely taken over by a bunch of Myrish exiles who were fleeing the civil war in their homeland. Lord Tarth had petitioned the Iron Throne to help him dispatch of these nuisances, and so he sent his master of ships and his son and heir forth to meet them in the narrow sea. Before they left, Aemon's daughter and Corlys' wife, Rhaenys, announced that she was pregnant, and in their eyes, the succession was even more secure now that Rhaenys had a child of her own. Prince Aemon discussed strategy with his son by law, and flew ahead on Caraxes to meet Lord Cameron and allow Corlys to catch up with him. But sadly, Aemon would never meet his son by law again. After taking an errant crossbow bolt from a Myris exile, Prince Aemon died on Tarth, and a matter of the succession blew over. At Rhaenys' birth, her grandmother, Queen Alysan, had proclaimed her our queen-to-be, but Jaehaerys had never made any such proclamation. The old king had tended to lean towards preferring male heirs over female heirs, and it had been a point of great contention in his marriage. When Aemon died, the matter of succession came up once again, and Jaehaerys passed over Rhaenys, his eldest technical heir, for Balon, his eldest male heir. This caused the second quarrel between the king and the queen, but Lord Corlys' mood was beyond quarrelsome to say the least. He was outraged that his wife had been passed over in the matter of succession, and quit his position on the small council as a result, taking his bride and his ships back to Driftmark, where his children Leda and Lenor were born in 94 AC and 97 AC respectively. When Rhaenys' uncle Balon died of a burst belly in 101 AC, Lord Corley saw it as an opportunity to reclaim his lost rights. Jaehaerys was old and getting more senile by the day. There was no way he could have made the right call in such a state. It was said that after Prince Balon died and word reached high tide, Lord Corley's began gathering ships and men to defend his family family's rights. After consulting with his son Archmaester Vagon, Jaehaerys decided to call for a great council where every claim to the Iron Throne would be heard and considered and the decision would be made by the Lords of the Realm. By the time 101 AC had come around, Lord Corlys had solidified his position as a big player in Westerosi politics, and he put all the wealth he had acquired on his nine voyages to good use here. It is said that 14 claims were heard at the Great Council, and we know that at least three of these belong to House Valerion. The first was Princess Rhaenys herself, who should have been queen by the law of primogeniture, but it was once again being passed over on account of her sex. From this day onward, Rhaenys was given the nickname the Queen Who Never Was, something we're pretty sure she hated every time she heard it. The second was Corlys' eldest child Lena, but she too was passed over on account of her sex. The third Valerion, up for contention however, was hard to pass over. Lenor Valerion was young, a Valerian, had an established dragon bond with Sea Smoke, and was the son of the most powerful power couple in all of the Seven Kingdoms. Plus he was being backed by House Valerion and House Baratheon, his father's entire wealth, his mother's influence, the Starks, the Manderleys, the Dustins, and the Black Woods. That's at least three of the biggest houses in Westeros in favor of Laenor. But at the end of the day, everyone knew that male inheritance would always take precedence, and so Balon's son Viserys ascended the Iron Throne instead of Corlys' son Laenor. The Sea Snake took this to be the second slight upon his own person by House Targaryen, even though the vote was procedurally more democratic than anything else in the history of the Seven Kingdoms. But he was about to feel the disrespect even harder, because when King Viserys' wife Queen Emma died in 105 AC, it was all but expected that he would immediately move to heal the rift between House Targaryen and House Valerion by marrying Corlys' daughter Lena. It is said that Grand Maester Runciter was the one who proposed the match, but one has to remember that Corlys' influence at this point was practically everywhere, but the king chose to defy his small council and listen to his heart, choosing for his wife the Lady Alicent Hightower, claiming he was marrying for love. This light was too much for Lord Corlys, and he moved to make alliances that were directly antagonistic towards the Iron Throne and Viserys himself. 
when the royal wedding took place in 106 AC, House Valerion was notable due to its absence, but little did the world know that they were planning a marriage of their own. Corlys betrothed his daughter, Lena, to the son of the Sea Lord of Bravos. A marriage, if it went through, would give him total domination of the Narrow Sea all the way down to the Stepstones. And to take care of the Stepstones, Corlys decided to ally with the king's own brother, the rogue Prince Daemon Targaryen. The Stepstones had been governed by an eternal alliance called the Triarchy for nearly a decade and they were imposing exorbitantly high taxes on every ship passing by. Lord Corlys needed to either get those taxes down or get the Triarchy out of there, and he chose the latter, spending three years leading the navies of his and Daemon's combined forces while he led the army and fought on Dragonback. When the fighting was all but won in 109 AC, Daemon declared himself the King of the Narrow Sea, and Corlys placed a crown upon his head. Having secured the Windsept and barren yet strategically important islands, Lord Corlys effectively controlled the Narrow Sea itself with his massive fleet. Though his name never comes up again when the histories speak of the kingdom he and Daemon created, we can assume that Corlys left behind a token force to help his king keep control of his kingdom. Lord Corlys finally got to fulfill his ambition to tying the Valerian name to the history of the Iron Throne in 113 AC, when his son Laenor was chosen to become Prince consort for Princess Rhaenyra Targaryen and readily agreed to the match. He welcomed three grandchildren from his son's marriage to the crown princess, apparently unaware of the rumor about their births, and insisted upon giving the first two boys traditional Valerian names. His ignorance of his grandchildren's births went so far that he did not even protest to King Viserys essentially turning his other blood relatives into mutes for repeating salacious rumors about his good daughter's children. By the time Daemon had grown bored of his meager kingdom, the son of the Sea Lord had proven himself to be a waste and a fool, and a most unseemly match of Corlys' daughter Lena, who was now a dragon rider thanks to bonding with Vagar. So when Corlys was approached by Daemon for Lena's hand, he accepted and discreetly consented to Daemon disposing of his problem for him. Through this marriage, he would welcome two more grandchildren, and High Tide would see more Targaryens and dragons than even the Century of Blood. Thanks to Lord Corlys' unrelenting pursuit of just plain success, two towns had sprung up on the Isle of Driftmark, Spicetown and Hull, and the place had even started drawing away trade from King's Landing. All signs pointed towards a very good future for House Valerion when the unthinkable, yet totally predictable, happened. Queen Alicent declared her son Aegon king, and Rhaenyra announced her own rival coronation at Dragonstone. Lord Corlys was one of the staunchest supporters of Rhaenyra, and his navy was one of their biggest assets. Throughout the course of the war, Corlys would only gain more power and titles whilst losing everything and everyone he loved and be forced to seek kingship in a couple of bastards. He would rise to become the first known Hand of the Queen, and would later even be integral to the actions of the future regime, though not in any way that you're expecting him to. This is where we're going to stop talking about the Sea Snake's involvement in the Dance of the Dragons, because we might as well give the entire show away to you otherwise, but this is also where we switch gears to House of the Dragon, and how they have handled the portrayal of the Sea Snake. Blood or no, Vaymond, I will not have you stoke mutiny. He commands a room like no one else and has earned our respect, Corlys in House of the Dragon. From the moment Steve Toussaint entered our screens wearing that beautiful silver-white wig, we knew that his portrayal of Lord Corlys Valerion was going to be something special, and we were right. Sure, there are a lot of changes to the character, like the fact that apparently House of the Dragon Corlys' mom was a Summer Islander, and that he was on Viserys' small council for nine years when in Fire and Blood, he never even served him. But the way Steve Toussaint commands a room makes you believe that this is the sea snake we loved when we met him for the first time in Fire and Blood. Lord Corlys in House of the Dragon has clear ambitions, but the thing that is different about him is the fact that he has more agency in the show. Yes, the format of Fire and Blood is such that we will never know who actually decided what to do and when, but that's the beauty of House of the Dragon. It fills in the blanks perfectly. In the case of Corlys, he quits the small council not when Rhaenys is passed over, which happens at the Great Council in the show, but when Viserys rejects Lena for Alicent, something he is present to bear witness to. 
Because the show is mostly set in three major locations, Dragonstone, Driftmark, and King's Landing, we get a lot more of the court-savvy side of Lord Corley's early on in the show, where he and his wife are maneuvering the chess pieces into place whilst they joke about the other lords of the realm in private. Rhaenys gives birth to Laenor and Lena, presumably in King's Landing, and raises them there at the royal court, and Laenor is the elder sibling in House of the Dragon, not Lena. Episode 1 sees Corlys bring up two of the biggest problems from his perspective, the Triarchy and the matter of succession. He petitions the Iron Throne for leave to attack the Crab Feeder, but is denied due to Viserys' patient and diplomatic approach. He also reminds the Council following the death of Prince Balon, Viserys' son, that is, not his father, that the King already has an heir in Prince Daemon Targaryen. Over the next two episodes, Corlys tries to get the wrongs committed against his family righted by personally approaching the king with a marriage proposal between him and Corlys' daughter, Lena. Corlys points out all the reasons that the match would be the right one for all parties involved, but is ultimately rejected, after which he propositions Prince Daemon with a chance to win glory by waging war in the Stepstones. Corlys takes his son Laenor and his brother Vaemon, nephew in fire and blood, to the war and fights alongside Daemon for three years. After the rogue prince defeats the crab feeder, Corlys gives him his crown, made out of driftwood, and returns to high tide as the new triarchy, as new master of ships, Tyland Lannister puts it. When King Viserys comes to propose a match between his daughter Rhaenyra and Corlys' son Laenor, the Sea Snake chooses to compile all the disrespect from the book by pulling a power move and just having his daughter receive the king and the future queen of Westeros. When Viserys announces his intent, Corlys accepts with clear glee in his eye, and his ambitions are confirmed when he asks Viserys if her nearest children and her children's children would rule with the name Valerion. The king says that Rhaenyra's children would bear the Valerion name, yes, but her grandchildren would bear the Targaryen name, thereby ensuring that the House of the Dragon stayed in control ultimately. That was good enough for Corlys, who accepted the match despite knowing about Laenor's tastes. Like any good medieval feudal lord, Corlys expects his son to grow out of it once he experiences a woman, but his wife knows better, as she does on most occasions. The relationship between the Sea Snake and his Red Queen is one of the best things about the show, and is crucial to the events that will unfold in the future, and maybe we might also get a blast from the Sea Snake's past, because one of the other people shows in development at HBO is based on his nine voyages, and it can most certainly become a massive success now that everyone has seen just how good Corley's is on screen. Going ahead, expect to see Steve Toussaint much more on your screens, and prepare to have your mind blown as the series draws to an end. Trust us, it will be worth it. Legacy of Lord Corley's Valerion, the Sea Snake of Driftmark when he passed away at the age of 79, Lord Corlys Valerion had a life most people would genuinely dream of having. He was one of the best seafarers of his generation easily, and one of the greatest naval commanders in Westerosi history. His nine voyages became the basis of an entire book written by Maester Mathis, and made House Valerion, temporarily, so rich that entire towns were springing out wherever Corlys made his den. By the time of his death, he had served multiple rulers in various capacities. As master of ships, as a hand, and even as a lord regent, he followed in his grandfather Daemon's footsteps in that he managed to make House Valerion truly great once again, but his legacy would not be survived with good grace. After the deaths of his legitimized heirs, House Valerion became a shell of what it once was, and they have never been, and will probably never be, able to reach the heights of success that the Sea Snake did. In his lifetime, he had created an entirely new seat of power off of wealth he made personally, oversaw the construction of two new towns, commanded countless men into countless campaigns, sailed the seas of the world, and probably gathered enough material to write about another seven voyages if you catch our drift. When he passed, all who mourned him did so with respect, and he was given the traditional Valerion funeral rite, being buried at sea off the Sea Snake. He could have given the maesters at the Citadel at least two decades worth of knowledge if he just decided to become a scholar after completing his voyages, but instead, he played the Game of Thrones, and somehow managed to come out with his reputation and his head intact. Over a century and a half following his death, the realm has truly never seen his like again, and we're not sure that's entirely a bad thing. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.